Maria Antoinette is my seventh cousin seven times removed. Maria Antonia was born on November 2nd, 1755 at the Hofburg Palace in Vienna, Austria at 8.30 in the evening. She was the youngest daughter of Empress Maria Theresa, ruler of the Habsburg Empire, and her husband Francis I, Holy Roman Emperor. Her godparents were Joseph I and Mary Anna Victoria, King and Queen of Portugal, Archduke Joseph and Archduchess Maria Anna acted as proxies for their newborn sister. Maria Antonia was born on All Souls Day, a Catholic day of mourning, and during her childhood her birthday was instead celebrated on the day before All Saints Day. Due to the connotations of the date, shortly after her birth, she was placed under the care of governess of the imperial children, Countess von Brandeis. Maria Antonia was raised together with her sister, Maria Carolina, who was three years older and with whom she had a lifelong close relationship. Maria Antonia had a difficult but ultimately loving relationship with her mother, who referred to her as the little Madame Antoni. Maria Antonia spent her formative years between the Hofburg Palace and Stromarm, the Imperial summer residence in Vienna, where on October 13, 1762, when she was seven, she met Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, two months her junior, and a child prodigy. Despite the private tutoring she received, the results of her schooling were less than satisfactory. At the age of 10, she could not write correctly in German or in any language commonly used at court, such as French or Italian, and conversations with her were stilted. Under the teaching of Christoph Willibald Gluck, Maria Antonia developed into a good musician. She learned to play the harp, the harpsichord, and the flute. She sang during family evening gatherings, and she was known to have a beautiful voice. She also excelled at dancing, had exquisite poise, and loved dolls. Following the Seven Years' War and the diplomatic revolution of 1756, Empress Maria Theresa decided to end hostilities with her longtime enemy, King Louis XV of France. Their common desire to destroy the ambitions of Persia and Great Britain and to secure a definite peace between their respective countries led them to seal their alliance with a marriage on February 7, 1770. Louis XV formally requested the hand of Maria Antonia for his eldest surviving grandson and heir, Louis Auguste Duc de Berry and Dauphin, France. Maria Antonia formally renounced her rights to Habsburg domains, and on April 19, she was married by proxy to the Dauphin of France at the Augustinian Church in Vienna, with her brother Archduke Ferdinand standing in for the Dauphin. On May 14, she met her husband at the edge of the forest of Compagnie, Upon her arrival in France, she adopted the French version of her name, Marie Antoinette. A further ceremonial wedding took place on May 16, 1770, in the Palace of Versailles, and after the festivities, the day ended with the ritual bedding. The couple's long-time failure to consummate the marriage plagued the reputations of both Louis Auguste and Marie Antoinette for the next seven years. The initial reaction to the marriage between Marie Antoinette and Louis Auguste was mixed. On the one hand, the Dauphin was beautiful, personable, and well-liked by the common people. On June 8, 1773 was a astounding success. On the other hand, those opposed to the alliance with Austria had a difficult relationship with Marie Antoinette and did others who disliked her for more personal and petty reasons. Madame du Barry proved a troublesome foe to the Dauphin. 
She was Louis the Fifteenth's mistress and had considerable political influence over him. In 1770, she was instrumental in ousting Etienne Francois, Duc de Chesseau, who had helped orchestrate the Franco Austrian alliance and Marie Antoinette's marriage and in exiling his sister, the Duchess de Gramont, one of Marie Antoinette's ladies-in-waiting. Marie Antoinette was persuaded by her husband's aunts to refuse to acknowledge du Berry, which some saw as a political blunder that jeopardized Austria's interest at the French court. Marie Antoinette's mother and the Austrian ambassador to France, Count de Mercy, Argentu, who sent the Empress secret report on Marie Antoinette's behavior, pressured Marie Antoinette to speak to Madame du Berry, which she grudgingly agreed to do on New Year's Day in 1772. She merely commented to her, there are a lot of people at Versailles today, but it was enough for Madame du Berry who was satisfied with this recognition, and the crisis passed. Upon the death of Louis XV, on May 10, 1774, the Dauphin ascended the throne as King Louis XVI of France and Navarre, with Marie Antoinette as his royal consort. At the onset, the new queen had limited political influence with her husband, who, with the support of his two most important ministers, Chief Minister Muir Ripa and Foreign Minister, blocked several of her candidates from assuming important positions, including Swazel. The queen did play a role in the disgrace and exile of the most powerful of Louis XV's ministers, the Duc de Agrion. On May 24, 1774, two weeks after the death of Louis XV, the king gave his wife the Petit Triomphe, a small chateau on the grounds of Versailles that had been built by Louis XV for his mistress, Madame de Pompadour. Louis XVI allowed Marie Antoinette to renovate it to suit her own taste. Soon, rumors circulated that she had plastered the walls with gold and diamonds. The queen spent heavily on fashion, luxuries, and gambling, though the country was facing a grave financial crisis and the population was suffering. Rose Burton created dresses for her and hairstyles such as poofs up to three feet high and the spray of feathers. As a result of all these fashion activities, Marie Antoinette presided over one of the most important and fashionable courts in history, and she was dominant over all of her ladies of the court. As for her bearing and appearance, the queen was very majestic and charismatic in spite of the fact that she gained a lot of weight over the years due to her many pregnancies marie antoinette represented and played the role of the queen better than anyone in her court with her grace and demeanor by the time of the Lore War of 1775, a series of riots due to the high price of flour and bread had damaged her reputation among the general public. Eventually, Marie Antoinette's reputation was no better than that of the favorite previous kings. Many French people blame her for the degrading economic situation, suggesting the country's inability to pay off its debts was the result of her wasting the crown's money. In her correspondence, Marie Antoinette's mother, Maria Theresa, expressed concern over her daughter's spending habits, citing the civil unrest it was beginning to cause. As early as 1774, Marie Antoinette had begun to befriend some of her male admirers, such as the Baron de Bonceval and the Duc de Coigny, Count Valentine Esterazzi, and also formed deep friendships with various ladies at court. Most noted was Marie-Louise Princess de Lambelle, related to the royal family through her marriage into the Penchave family. On September 19, 1774, she 
appointed her superintendent of her household, an appointment she soon transferred to her favorite, the Duchess de Polignac. Marie Antoinette famously struggled to have children with her husband, King Louis XVI of France, and the young couple did not consummate their marriage for several years despite constant pressures from the palace, family, and diplomat. The queen's desire to produce her heir led her to adopt a child called Francois Michel from the street. However, once she gave birth to her first child, Marie Therese, she lost interest in her adopted son, causing a fraught relationship between Francois Michel and the royals that lasted the remainder of his life. Marie Antoinette had four biological children, Marie Therese in 1778 to 1851, Louis Joseph 1781 to 1789, Louis the 17th, 1785 to 1795, and Sophie, 1786 to 1787. Marie Antoinette began to abandon her more carefree activities to become increasingly involved in politics in her role as Queen of France. By publicly showing her attention to the education and care of her children, the Queen sought to improve the dissolute image she had acquired in 1785 from the diamond necklace affair, in which public opinion had falsely accused her of criminal participation in defrauding the jewelers Bomer and Bessinge of the price and expensive diamond necklace they had originally created for Madame du Berry. The main actors in this scandal were Cardinal de Rohan, Prince de Rohan Germinet, Great Almonier of France, and Jeanine de Volet Saint Remy, Countess de Lamotte, a descendant of an illegitimate child of Henry II of France, of the House of Alois. Marie Antoinette had profoundly disliked Rohan since the time he had been French ambassador to Vienna when she was a child. Despite his high clerical position at the court, she never addressed a word to him. Others involved were Nicole Lacroix, alias Baron de Olivia, a prostitute who happened to look like Marie Antoinette, Rutois de Villette, a foreigner, Janine de Valois' husband. Madame de Lamont tricked Rohan into buying the necklace as a gift to Marie Antoinette for him to gain the queen's favor. When the affair was discovered, those involved except de Lamont and Vito de Villette, who both managed to flee, were arrested, tried, convicted, and either imprisoned or exiled. Madame de Lamont, Petit Salpetari Hospital, which also served as a prison for women, and despite the fact that the guilty parties were tried and convicted, the affair proved to be extremely damaging to her reputation, which her reputation never recovered from it. France's financial problems were the result of a combination of factors, several expensive wars, a large royal family whose expenditures were paid by the state, and an unwillingness on the part of the members of the privileged classes, aristocracy, and clergy to help defray the costs of the government out of their own pockets by relinquishing some of their financial privileges. As a result of the public perception that she had single-handedly ruined the national finances, Marie Antoinette was given the nickname Madame Deficit in the summer of 1787. While the sole fault of the financial crisis did not lie with her, Marie Antoinette was the biggest obstacle to any major reform effort. She had played a decisive role in the disgrace of the former minister of France, Turgot, in 1776, and Jacques Nectar, first dismissal in 1781. If the secret expenses of the queen were taken into account, court expenses were much higher than the official estimate of 7% of the state budget. On October 5th, a crowd from Paris descended on Versailles and forced the royal family to move to the Tuileries Palace in Paris, where they lived under a form of house arrest under the watch of Lafayette's Garde Nationale. 
While the Count de Provence and his wife are allowed to reside in the Petit Luxembourg, where they remained until they went into exile on June 20th, 1791. Marie Antoinette continued to perform charitable functions and attended religious ceremonies, but dedicated most of her time to her children. She also played an important political, all but not public, role between 1789 and 1791 when she had a complex set of relationships with several key actors of the early period of the French Revolution. One of the most important was Necker, the Prime Minister of Finance. Despite her dislike of him, she played a decisive role in his return to the office. She blamed him for his support of the revolution and did not regret his resignation in 1790. Lafayette, one of the former military leaders in the American War of Independence, 1775 to 1783, served as the warden of the royal family in his position as commander-in-chief of Guard Nationale. Despite his dislike of the queen, he distrusted her as much as she distrusted him, and at one time had even threatened to send her to a convent. He was persuaded by the mayor of Paris, Jean Sylvain Belay, to work and collaborate with her, and allowed her to see Farson a number of times. He even worked as far as exiling the Duke of Orleans, accused by the Queen of fomenting trouble. His relationship with the King was more cordial. As a liberal aristocrat, he did not want fall of the monarchy, but rather the establishment of a liberal one, similar to the one of the United Kingdom. Based on cooperation between the King and the people, as was to be defined in the Constitution of 1791, Charged with treason against the French Republic, Louis XVI was separated from his family and tried in December. He was found guilty by the convention, led by the Jacobins, who rejected the idea of keeping him as a hostage. On January 15, 1793, by a majority of six votes, he was condemned to death by guillotine and executed on January 21, 1793. Marie Antoinette was tried by the Revolutionary Tribunal on October 14, 1793. She and her lawyers were given less than one day to prepare her defense. Among the accusations, many previously published in the Libelle, were orchestrating orgies in Versailles, sending millions of treasury money to Austria, planning the massacre of the National Guard, declaring her son to be the new King of France, and incest, a charge made by her son Louis Charles, pressured into doing so by the radical Jacques Hebert who controlled him. This last accusation drew an emotional response from Marie Antoinette, who refused to respond to this charge, instead appealing to all mothers present in the room. Their reaction comforted her since these women were not otherwise sympathetic to her. Early on October 16, Marie Antoinette was declared guilty of three main charges against her. Depletion of the National Treasury, conspiracy against the internal and external security of the state, and high treason because of her intelligence activities in the interest of the enemy, the later charge alone was enough to condemn her to death. Marie Antoinette was guillotined at 12.15 p.m. on October 16, 1793. Her last words are recorded as, Pardon me, sir, I did not do it on purpose after accidentally stepping on her executioner's shoe. Her body was thrown into an unmarked grave in the Madeleine Cemetery located close by the Rue de Ajou. Because its capacity was exhausted, the cemetery was closed the following year on March 25, 1794. Royalists who saw her as a martyr later recovered her body and reburied it in the Bourbon Crypt in Paris.